Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. The topic of today's panel discussion is going to be about one of the most challenging issues in business, which is being able to sustain healthy profits while trying to protect and safeguard the concerns of shareholders, such as the environment, such as community welfare. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit today about how businesses tread that that delicate line, it's a balancing act, isn't it? Trying to maintain your profitability and still do a good job of supporting the interest of the community. So our panelists today, I'm going to go across and introduce you to my left here. We have Matthew Driver. Matthew is the Group Executive for Global Products and Solutions at MasterCard Asia Pacific. We were chatting um, right before we came in here. He's got five kids. I'll tell you a little bit about each of our panelists so you'll get to know them a little bit better. Five children. And uh, he's excited about MasterCard's Islamic payments platform uh, that they are uh, in the process of, of, of putting out there. So we'll be talking to him a little bit about that later on. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> next, uh, next to Matthew, we have Dato Musafar Hisham. He is the CEO for Maybank Islamic Berhad and the group head of Islamic banking for Maybank here in Malaysia, of course. And uh, he says he's a huge sports fan. He doesn't say he's very good at it, but we don't believe him. And uh, he was named Islamic Banker of the Year in 2013. So we have a lot of expertise up on the stage today. Let's give him a round of applause for Musafar. And next to Musafar, we have Ayam Amin Sajini. He is the CEO of Bank Alcare Group in the Kingdom of Bahrain. And, and he has an interesting background as well because he's half Saudi and half German. And he says it is in his DNA, it is his passion to connect the Muslim world with the rest of the world. Let's give him a round of applause as well. And finally, we are joined by Mela Araz. He is the Managing Director for Ata Invest from the Republic of Turkey. And uh, he's also a member of the board on uh, Tab Food Investments and uh, also Ata Invest as well, of course. And um, he is a former banker, now involved in the fast food business. So he's branching out and he is very bullish on China. Let's give him a round of applause as well for Mele. So thank you for joining us, gentlemen. Let's kick off today by getting um, a couple of minutes from each of you about your view on, on sustainability um, from, from your perspective, sustainable profits. Tell us what you're seeing, what are the trends, and what are the ideas that are catching your attention and look the best to you? Let's kick it off with you, Matthew. Sure. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Well, I think the, the interesting thing about the, the sustainable business model or the, the need to look at a much broader um, bunch of um, stakeholders has really been proven in the literature uh, more recently. Um, publications like Harvard Business Review, um, et cetera, really point out that the, the long-term return to shareholders are improved when their interests are not considered paramount, actually, when you're not completely focused on the interests of shareholders alone. And I, and I think that comes out of the idea that you need to really view business um, as an ecosystem, right? It's a, it's a bunch of different groups that cooperate together to, to maximize value in a, or maximize value creation in a particular ecosystem and then compete to see if they can realize um, the share of that value. So what you really need to be able to do if you're uh, thinking that through is that as we see the technology changing and much more complexity coming into our businesses, you realize that you're going to, no single company can do everything by themselves. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden, you know, you're driven to, to be more partner oriented. You're, you're driven to be able to need to develop and collaborate across an ecosystem. Um, in some cases, you might have to collaborate with people who you might have thought were originally competitive. And I also think that in addition to that, you're seeing much broader interest in, in pure green sustainability issues. So um, that cause marketing, um, being a good corporate citizen, doing well by doing good is actually particularly important if we're going to attract um, the, the new millennial employee into our, our corporation. So I think that people are recognizing that all of a sudden you've got this need to manage across an ecosystem and that you will yourself do well as a business by doing that, and that's really driving this big, big, big change mm -hmm. in sustainability, because if you can deliver a, a model that will sustain the, your ecosystem, sustain um, the communities in which you operate, then you will attract the right mm -hmm. kind of people, 
you'll have the right kind of innovation and you'll be able to drive your business forward for the foreseeable future. All right, wonderful points. Thank you for that, Matthew Driver. Okay, uh, Musafar, give us your view, a couple of minutes on what you're seeing out there, trends with sustainable profit, and, and your view. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much, Lisa, and thank you, WIEF. Maybe I should just uh, start off, uh, give a brief introductory on the journey of Maybank Islamic. And now to see the evolution of, of where we are now and uh, to highlight of uh, why we need to go through this journey to ensure a long-term sustainability of our organization. Uh, we are now the, uh, uh, one of the, the, the largest Islamic bank in, in Asia, uh, we're the, in terms of assets and the third largest in, in the world. But five years ago, when we embark on a journey, uh, we are part of the Maybank Group, which is the largest market capitalization here in Malaysia, uh, in embarking the growth in Islamic uh, banking. Uh, the, the board and the shareholders put in a commitment and, uh, to ensure that we, we grew and complement uh, the group. Uh, and that's the key focus. We need to make sure that we are strong. We, make sh we need to make sure that we are given the right returns to the shareholders. Uh, we need to ensure that we maximize efficiency of what Maybank already have as a commercial, conventional bank and to ensure that Islamic banking complement that. Uh, before we embark into the uh, other area of growth uh, and ensuring to serve the community, to ensure that we are providing the, the right uh, form of uh, product and services and deliver uh, the sustainable not only to the shareholders but more importantly to the other various stakeholders. So our key journey was to ensure that we uh, provide a strong foundation. Uh, for example, we were only contributing in terms of financing to the main bank group in 2010, about 15% of the total assets. Uh, now in Malaysia, we're already touching 50% of that contribution. We wanted to ensure that we maximize our efficiency in terms of cost to income. So uh, that we are now maintaining close to about 35% cost to income uh, ratio uh, uh, overall vis-a-vis uh, -vis compared to, to the other banks. We want to ensure that we give the best returns to the shareholders, uh, touching at least a double digit of 17 to 19% or, uh, or slightly touching 20% mm -hmm. uh, growth. So the, the first two years of the journey is to ensure that we're strong, to ensure that we give the right uh, returns and ensuring the best practice that what Maybank already has and to ensure that the Islamic uh, uh, financing product and service to complement at the best ability that we can. And later on, I, I'm more than happy to share what are the evolution that we see uh, to ensure the sustainability part of it. Thank Looking you. forward to it. Thank you so much for that, Mosafar. Okay, Ayman. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, my basic view on uh, sustainability is uh, the known saying uh, from our prophet is, أعمل لدنياك كأنك تعيش أبدا وأعمل لآخرتك كأنك تموت غدا. And it basically mentions in this way that you should work for your life that you're living in as if you're living forever, but yet you have to work for your life after and the akhra as if you're dying tomorrow. In this way, I think you have to think about how long the sustainability will be of whatever you work on. Um, and this would be probably the lesson for people to know that they should not look at short term, they should not shoot for products that are uh, going to destructible or maybe have uh, some I would say environmental uh, negative effects. At the same time, it's known for us uh, that we have the other uh, saying is man ya'mal minkum amalan falyatqinu. Those of you who uh, works on something or conducts any particular work should try to his best to perfect it. Um, perfectionism uh, doesn't need to be a paranoia process, but you should have the thought of trying to do your best to make it right, uh, make it uh, quality to its best. And this way people, when they utilize any of your products, whether it's an investment idea or if it's an investment product or if it's uh, a thought of uh, uh, a material, a car that you're using, or if you're uh, thinking of uh, having a road being constructed or a home, in all of that sense, uh, perfecting that job and making it right uh, will also be a a great lesson for us to keep as a checkbox. Once we have these two checkpoints done in place, then we have uh, the third checkpoint, um, 
that we don't become mubazir. إن المبذرين كان أخوان الشياطين وكان الشيطان الربي كفورة. التبذير means uh, that you are uh, wasteful and those who are wasteful uh, they're the brothers of uh, shaitan and the shaitan is you know kafir in front of Allah. So again, uh, don't be wasteful in your way of doing anything, uh, whether it's uh, working at uh, your job or um, uh, producing a product or uh, putting yourself into uh, uh, a production line, the less you think of how much that would be wasted in that whole production line, the higher the efficiency is, and that's what they call sometimes uh, six segment, some institutions, or it will uh, enhance the outcome of uh, your product. At the same time, uh, that applies for investments. Uh, try to invest wisely for your clients, and it applies for institutions like banks, uh, that you put your money exactly as much as possible, as efficiently as possible to its place and uh, don't waste it. If it's at home, uh, don't try to have uh, your food wasted or thrown away. Try to you'll use as much as possible efficiency. So uh, this is kind of my three-liner uh, thought for uh, sustainability and inshallah it becomes beneficial for uh, all of you and definitely to myself all and right. to the Ummah and the world. Okay, thank you so much for that. Uh, Melly. Sure, uh, I just want to try to put this into a conceptual framework. Uh, I think it's been an interesting journey from the days of Milton Friedman in the 60s, where I'm the, the championed by the, uh, Mr. Friedman in the 60s as the sole purpose of the firm is the profit maximization for the shareholder. And we've come a, we've come a very long way since then and now we're talking about socially responsible corporation today. Yeah. I think nobody's defending the simplistic, narrowly defined theory of sh shareholder capitalism that focuses on profit maximization anymore. But the latter concepts that have started emerging in the 80s and 90s have recently gained significant momentum as wider issues and drivers such as global warming, poverty, environmental concerns, continue to find, I think, a very increasing attention on the global agenda. Uh, so the wind is blowing uh, only in one direction, uh, not the other way around. Uh, so uh, the no long-term returns, long-term returns to shareholders are improved when short, their short-term interests are not paramount. I think this is becoming the motto for the business at the moment. Making the bottom line your your first priority may not be the best way to improve profitability in today's world. No system can thrive if one member of the group continually benefits at the expense of the others. Uh, so we need to strategically balance how value is shared between amongst the different stakeholders and I, with, the, with the aim to maximize such value generation in the long run. So short-termism term, short is out as well. Um, the, I think a sustainability-oriented company, responsible company, is the one that takes into account economic, social, and environmental dimensions of its processes and performances. Uh, therefore, the financial and competitive success, social legitimacy, and efficient use of natural resources are intertwined. So, I'll stop here. Mm. You Googled the 60s, right? You don't remember it. You're not, <laughs> you're not talking from personal experience. All right, we're going to get the, uh, the discussion underway now with the Q&A session. Uh, just a reminder that a little bit later, we are going to be throwing it open to you folks out there in the audience. So if you have any questions, um, jot them down. I will give you uh, plenty of time to get your questions to any or all of the panelists, and we'll just get you to stand up, and we'll give you a microphone when you want to uh, put a question to the panel. So guys, I want to kick it off with a, a pretty basic question. In your opinion, does a company have to sacrifice at least some of its profitability to make the switch to a responsible and sustainable business model? Who wants to take that one first? Okay. Um, I believe actually it's the opposite side. Um, by being responsible and uh, sustainable, you could actually uh, increase and enhance uh, your profitability because uh, if you're a manufacturing line and you reduce uh, your um, production of uh, or waste of some of your products that you produce by using as much as possible the right amount of uh, steel or if you have chemicals and pharmaceuticals, if you reduce that to the exact amount, then that's sustainability and that could uh, enhance your bottom line. Uh, 
um, if you invest uh, wisely in investments or if you uh, use economy class for flights that are less than three hours, <laughs> and again, it, uh, it will get you to do the business and you haven't really lost the bottom line, uh, but it will actually enhance it. But still, you can get the business done and uh, by spending the expenses in a wise way rather than uh, wasting it and be a sustainable institution when difficult times come. Mm, okay. Yeah? Um, um, Mustafar, I see yeah. you nodding. You agree? Well, I, I agree with uh, Ayman. In fact, when your first point about Niat, you know, in fact, I just realized when you mentioned Lisa, but uh, Ayman's background, you have the beauty of Saudi culture and the efficiency of the German. Alhamdulillah. So, uh, <laughs> so th thank God, Allah <laughs> here. <laughs> so I just, just came to mind. Uh, but I, I want to go back to the point uh, of the journey again. You know, uh, there was a very famous professor out of Colombia by the uh, name of Simon Sinet, and, and uh, we, we were taken uh, on this, uh, the management of Maybank Islamic. We asked ourselves, what do we do and how do we do it? And that's something that we know very well. But when the question of came about of why do we do it, uh, that was a bit tough. Uh, it's not a question of uh, profit. I mean, profit is a result of what we do. Uh, but why do we give financing for a home? Why do we give a financing for an SME? Why do we get uh, investments and, and we give them a returns. Uh, that's the, the tough question. It's not a question of we want to give the give of services and so forth. We want to give folks a better home. We want to give folks with a, 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 an opportunity uh, to, to do business in a, under the SME was mentioned. We want to make sure that we want to give opportunity and ensure the market takes responsibility mm. in doing that. So that was the uh, it was surprisingly, it was a tough question for us to, to, to answer. And that's when we shift our paradigm to look at when we do business, we want to make sure that we answer this question of why. Uh, and I'm, I'm very pleased that, you know, that uh, for Islamic institutions or a, a Shia uh, companies and so forth, you know, the one part that we don't take for granted but we want to really enhance is on the payment of the zakat or the charity. Uh, if we do well and we make profits, this zakat is going to grow, going to do m and to serve that community and giving back that part. Now, this is one area that we should be passionate about. We should look at that uh, um, giving back to the society. And this is one key area of sustainability that um, uh, I'm, I'm very confident that we can strive more and we can do more. Thank okay. you. So, so, Matthew, you want yeah, to Yeah, no, in? I was just going to say, I, I think on this why point, that's, that's very, very important. At, at MasterCard, we talk about a, a world beyond cash, mm. right? And, and what we talk about there and what drives one of our key, key I guess, um, sustainability or, or community programs is our commitment to, to financial inclusion, right? So we see today two billion individuals are excluded from the financial system. And what we want to be able to do is bring... 500 million new consumers into the financial system by use of our products and services. And if we're going to do that, we're going to have to innovate more effectively, we're going to have to drive down um, the, the cost to mm -hmm. distribute, to manufacture, to serve those people. We're going to have to have more creative business models. We're going to have to partner differently. We're going to have to partner with a wider range of stakeholders. And by doing that, and, and I think the important thing is by doing that authentic, authentically and sincerely, um, you're going to build a better business because I'm going to be able to then bring those efficiencies across my entire business. Right. So, so, so it's this, not costing you? No, it's, it's, not, it's not costing. I think it's, you know, in many ways, uh, technology and, and this new cooperation and building these ecosystems actually allow us to... Uh, I guess do more with less, mm. if right. you like, and drive more efficiency across the board. Okay, let me take it a step further, and Melly, I'll get you to respond to this um, in, in a different framework. Instead of costing you in terms of profits, if you're going for a sustainable business model, could it be argued that it is, in fact, a form of protection for your earnings? Because it, it might even allow you to sustain economic downturns or, or environmental constraints, for example. I think that I think this is the idea. Uh, and it rests in the term sustainability, right? Uh, but before I uh, to answer your question, I, I just want to answer a question: What comprises the stakeholder mm. ecosystem? I think, 
uh, who are the stakeholders that we need to take into account, just following on Michael's point. Uh, see, we can look at it from a narrow perspective, which is the immediate ecosystem of the company, of the firm, our employees, suppliers, customers, partners, regulators, creditors, and, and whatnot. But in a broader sense, I think we're talking about the global village. Uh, and in, in the, I think most of the issues that are discussed during this week and so forth I relate to global issues such as power, mass poverty, environmentalism, and the global warming, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I think we should take a look at this issue from those both angles, broad and narrow uh, angles. Of course, in the long run, there's a need to broaden our horizons and include more stakeholders in our ecosystems. Uh, the, the corporate sustainability is the capacity of the firm operating over a long period of time depends on the sustainability of its stakeholder relationships. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, in the both narrow, narrow sense and in the, uh, in the broad, broad sense as well. Uh, so um, this is the way I do approach the issue. Uh, and and the, for example, in December, there's a meeting in Paris of, on climate change this is a, a, a follow-up to the Kyoto meetings and so forth. Ky Saudi has nothing to do with environmental issues. <laughs> Kyoto was basically uh, on the agenda of the major powers of the world. Mm -hmm. But this one, it is different. 150 countries will be participating in the Paris round. Right. So that kind of tells you the shift uh, of burden or the perspective is not just on the big, big economies, the G8 and whatever, mm -hmm. but throughout the world. Uh, and the, everybody has to contribute their share into this process. Absolutely. And I want to pick up on the theme of collaboration, which you brought up, Matt, in just a little bit. But first, I want to um, start with the big picture. So we've discussed profitability. Let's say... I'm a company, I'm a bank, and I want to start assessing my footprint and, and figuring out how I can convert my business model to become more sustainable. Where, where do I begin? What do I focus on? Any advice on, on where we start assessing ourselves? I'll go on. Okay. I, I think the most key important thing as a start for any organization is a question of ethics and integrity. Uh, if uh, the firm foundation of an, any organization compromise its integrity and ethics, uh, the whole thing will fall apart. Uh, we've seen uh, recent weeks on some corporations who uh, 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 compromise its uh, integrity. And you can completely see an immediate drop of their share value within 30, 40% in, in a couple of days. Uh, so I think I, I, would, I would start off with, with that uh, 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 point of uh, integrity and, and, and ethics uh, for any, any firm. Okay, Matt? I think that the, and so I guess we talked about this before, I mean, there is a, there is a critical point that, that overarches this about the, the, the need for you know, a vision and an authenticity and a and sincerity behind your business. So I think that and we, we can talk about examples of where that perhaps hasn't happened. I think that the, the biggest thing if you're going to be or look at a, a sustainable business model is um, really think about the, the ecosystem and the communities that you work in. And I think that, and, and against a particular um, social objective. Mm -hmm. Think about that much more carefully. So if, if we look at financial inclusion for, for MasterCard and, and, and how we want to enable that with, with our technology, that's working with a much a, a broader group. It's working with governments. It's not just working with regulators. It's working with um, social policy agencies. It's working with um, poverty alleviation um, folks, it's working with NGOs, it's working with development agencies, multilateral agencies, there's a huge lot of the communities, um, community interest groups, etc. And the, the idea behind this is that you need to be able to ensure that you know, everyone has got a good understanding and, and you're bringing people together. Mm. And I think if you are starting to look at um, what does sustainability mean, um, sustainability means that you're, you're demonstrating a commitment to a much broader group of stakeholders. And, and it sounds like a, a, a broad group of stakeholders and a broad set of topics as well. I mean, to be profitable, you often have to pick and choose which areas you're going to focus on. Do you have to do the same thing with sustainability? To, do you pick and choose, or do you just have to say, I'm going to be sustainable, I have to take input from all of these shareholders? Well, I think it's interesting. I think it depends on your business, right? If you're like a Unilever, I think it's very, and, and you, you know, you're, you're using water or you're using things in your supply processes, um, it's very, very important that there's a very obvious connection with different dimensions of sustainability, right? Um, you know, and against the sort of triple P structure or triple bottom line, you know, profits people, 
um, and planet, if you like, you know, there are different dimensions. So for us, um, we're a payment technology company. I don't, I don't, we don't have hundreds of thousands of employees. Mm. We don't have large plants and facilities. So what we're looking to do is say, well, where can we have an impact um, that's relevant for our business? And I think that right. that's why we've said, look, um, we, have, we do realize that cash, for example, costs an economy a lot of money. It costs money to print. It is difficult to distribute. You have to secure it. You, and, and there are lots of other wastage that, that cash creates. And so we're saying our, our electronic payment model addresses that level of sustainability right. at, at that level. But then more importantly, if we're doing something meaningful, it's actually saying, how can we use our services to actually make a meaningful contribution to these individuals mm. from an inclusion perspective? So um, if they have access to an electronic payment mechanism or a, an account, they can then save for the future. Right. They can get micro insurance. They can't. They won't be wiped out by a by a storm, and all of a sudden they'll be able to you know, provide for their family's future. And so that's sustainable for that community. Right. That and message becomes attractive to the people, and you sort of have a, a much stronger motivation within the core of your company mm -hmm. because, to Mustafa's point, you've got this vision and ethical and cause-driven core to your business. Right. And that's a mutually reinforcing kind of process. Okay, so you're making a difference where you can. Ivan and Mele, would you like to weigh in on what a company should should target if they're going to switch to a sustainable business model? Sure. I mean, I mean, reporting on your carbon footprint for your company sounds nice, but it's not enough. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice theory, uh, uh, right? Uh, yeah. I will start out with a very, uh, very simple management motto that we cannot manage what we cannot measure. Mm. So I think uh, an effective measurement system to manage the whole stakeholder relationships on a sustainable basis is very crucial to the heart of the problem. Uh, so it took us 40 years to agree on a, uh, to reach a consensus on a, a globally ag agreed financial reporting system, IFRS. Uh, so uh, as such, I think we, we have to develop some sort of a similar system for responsible company reporting. There, there have been certain attempts, such as TBL that my, my, Michael, you have mentioned, and balance scorecard, and some others are coming up as well. But uh, at the moment, we do lack uh, yet a uh, uniformly accepted standard of measuring what to measure, KPIs, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So in the absence of, a, of such a system, then it is basically very difficult to judge firms or corporations on a, on a just and even platform uh, because there is no one common yardstick that's applicable to all. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of work being done in this area. Academia, some, some agencies, institutions are basically uh, uh, working on that uh, good-heartedly, but we're not there yet, but that's happening. I think it, it is, it, it, we're, we're, we're moving in the right direction, I think. Mm, so evolving the, with the, the new way of thinking yeah, that, yeah. that we're looking yeah. at. Ayman. Yeah. Um, basically, I think uh, some institutions have um, subjective and some of them have objective uh, way of evaluating things. Um, I mean, it's great to have, of course, measurable uh, uh, steps uh, that you take, for example, in uh, uh, waste management, whether you're a factory or cost expenses in uh, financial institutions or uh, in any way uh, that you would like to utilize uh, your measurement uh, processes and tools. But then uh, there would be also the importance of the teachings of the subjective ones uh, that you have to uh, let people know that you want to be ethical, and uh, that's something that you probably need to teach them. Uh, you probably want them to know that they have to maybe think of themselves uh, where their anchor is at. Uh, some of them will use their religion as Muslims to have an anchor whereby they uh, know their heart is there and uh, that they will measure their ethical uh, views into that. Uh, others might have other ways of doing so, but it's good for them to question themselves What's your anchor? What will make you think that it's good? Some of them will just think about their parents or their family as their uh, controller of being ethical and not doing things wrong. Uh, people probably, when they left and uh, further their distance from it, uh, you would uh, find global institutions that have been very extremely known, have conducted very unethical uh, transactions that have affected us uh, globally whether financial institutions or uh, power-generating uh, plant or institutions, 
they did hurt us. They hurted our uh, lives. They hurted our trust in people. They hurted our views into the world. They hurted our pockets. So all of that uh, caused a uh, replica effect. So measuring it in one way and having ways to measure, but yet the subjective part is very important. You have to constantly remind people that we need them to be good. They need to be ethical. They need to remember that people are human beings that they're dealing uh -huh. with, and they need to deal with people as uh, they have children, they have families that they're taking care of, they have an environment that they want to live in, and that they want to stay there for a good long time. Of course, so, so you're referring to the, the subprime financial crisis and all of the damage that it did out there in the markets, and that raises an interesting question. Do you think that sustainability is something that we just do altruistically and companies will do it out of self-interest, or do you think it needs to be regulated and, and, and legislated by, by governments? It's, um, I think governments and uh, regulators uh, have always tried their best to um, regulate um, uh, the measurable part of the game. Uh, but then you have to really start getting people to understand uh, the subject of part. And that's have been a, a difficult part also in understanding uh, what's ethical for some people as from others. Uh, very cold-blooded, well, I'm making profits and um, I sell them, for example, a bond and uh, I make a profit, and it's a great profit. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. that they're losing 100% of it next day. But there are these things that you have to uh, get maybe institutions to start preaching maybe, to let people be reminded of that. Maybe regulators could maybe request what's your teachings in the, <laughs> in the offices or in the companies that you're in. And that could be something that can be done, but um, it it's really has to be, people have to look into themselves yeah. and really have to be self-judgment before somebody else judges them because mm. um, it's a difficult game for an outsider other than the person himself to control the game. Yeah, we, we are all human after all. Uh, Musafar. Uh, I may sound the other wrong side of the fence here. I think we shouldn't have more regulation. I think we should allow the market to discipline Ourself. I'm a true believer that if you do wrong or if you, uh, and, and you if not perform, the market will discipline you. Right. Uh, and I'm, I'm, uh, I, I believe in that. I think we've seen in that. Uh, I think the role of government or regulation should be in the form of providing more opportunity and providing a platform to be more transparent than allowing the market to be more efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, I'm a believer in that. Uh, and provide the opportunity in terms of growth and uh, uh, to ensure that getting better returns and hence uh, to provide better to the, to the community. Uh, and I, again, I agree on the panel earlier saying if we do well uh, and we provide back to the community, I'm a believer that there will be reciprocity back to the businesses. Right. Uh, and that's where the sustainability comes into creating that value. Uh, but of course, there's a debate about regulation and non-regulation, especially, especially in, uh, in, yeah. in, in, in our line of work. <laughs> <laughs> so so, so you're, you're advocating a base of capitalism and let the markets decide. Let the markets. And let the markets. So is it more difficult to be sustainable with all of these regulations that you guys are, are facing down right now? Does that make sustainability um, more of a challenge? If I, if I may say, we just, I mean, for me, I always wanted regulation to be clearer. Uh, you know, the, the more regulation is sometimes the possibility of being more vague. And that right. vagueness and not lack of clarity makes it a bit more tougher uh, okay. on that. I also think okay. you, you need to be, to be sensitive. Uh, and, if you, and, 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 and sometimes if you're looking at regulation, it needs to be quite, quite subtle. So uh, otherwise you'll tend to have unintended consequences. So I'm kind of with Musafa in, in the sense that you have to have clarity. You have to be, there has to be regulatory clarity, I guess demarcation and coordination, if you like. So mm -hmm. I think that if you're looking at um, responsible behaviors rather than specific business limitations, I think that's sort of um, something that we'd more advocate. So for example, in, in the inclusion space, there is the responsible um, finance um, group is, is just looking at how do you ensure that you're communicating benefits and, and engaging in the right kind of way. So um, you're not dealing with the, a situation where you know, your particular customers aren't particularly knowledgeable. Are you making sure that you've got full disclosure? So that's more of an encouragement for positive behaviours among the actors. At the same time, for example, if you have too stringent KYC requirements for um, underserved customers, they might not have the level of identity 
that, that the bank requires to you to be able to deliver the service. Mm -hmm. So what we say in, in the financial inclusion community is you need tiered and proportionate KYC, which means if I'm dealing with a relatively small amount of money um, that, you know, $100 or less, I require a much simpler form of identity. If I'm dealing with a million dollars, obviously I need much more structured mm -hmm. types of KYC, but quite and, and often... KYC is? Uh, know your customer. So, ah. you know, when you're trying to do um, payments, you need to be able to... Uh, any institution that's handling that needs to be able to know the customer, mm. needs to know where the money comes from, and also needs to know the, the purpose of, of the money. Um, and this is all related to, you know, terrorist financing and, and other things like that. So, obviously, it's critically important to have KYC. But at the same time, if you're going to drive an inclusion agenda and support, say, domestic remittances so you know, a, a migrant worker can pay their family, mm. it's no use saying to them, you need to give me 12 forms of identification because they won't have it. So you need to make sure that you have this sort of proportionate level um, of, of, of regulation mm. that acknowledges that, puts the right controls, but doesn't create the unintended consequence right. of not being able to, to serve um, the, the, I guess, the, the segment right. or, the, or the part of the population that we're all wanting to advance. And, and not easy because the regulators, like the rest of us, are finding their way after the, the, the subprime crisis, of course. Yeah, Billy. That, yeah, talking about the regulators and the financial crisis and so forth, I don't think we should uh, skip uh, just to reflect back on what happened since 2008, uh, what started in in the U.S. banking system mm -hmm. in 2008, I think, uh, deserves uh, great attention. Uh, for years, U.S. has been deregulating and re liberalizing the financial markets right. to, to, to extreme extents. So the U.S. banks basically uh, ha had power to do anything that, that they want. So it was basically completely deregulated and, and completely liberalized market. And we all know where we ended up with, right? Now we're talking about, I can give you some numbers on the fines that the U.S. banks have paid since then. $250 billion paid by the 20, top 20 banks. Uh, but uh, the fines is not, does not explain the whole situation here. But just look at the drop in the global growth right. because of the financial crisis and so forth. Despite all this monetary expansion that is going around the world, and the growth is not there. So 1%, 1% Global GDP growth is equal to seven and a half trillion dollars. Sorry, uh, no, one, one percent is what uh, seven hundred billion dollars. Uh, Two percent is one one half trillion dollars. So, so this is coming at the expense of such a reduction in growth mm -hmm. glo globally. Uh, so, I think the there's a the, the, uh, I'm a liberal myself, uh, and uh, I, I support uh, liberalism uh, and deregulation and, and so forth. Uh, but what happened in the U.S., I think uh, we should not forget. But, and what is happening now is just a complete reaction to that. Mm -hmm. think, and, and the sector is getting over-regulated. And like Michael said, know your customers. And then the, all the big banks in Europe and U.S., I mean, cannot do any, any business anymore, basically. Yeah, it's getting a lot harder, there's no question. Let's talk about collaboration. Uh, it's the big buzzword in so many aspects of the economy right now. Connectivity, connected cities, everyone's collaborating, governments are teaming up with, with hot young, shot, young, young hotshot companies um, to get the technology out there to, to have everyone connected. Can we use the same approach when it comes to sustain, sustainability in banking and in other businesses? You team up with someone, like you were mentioning, maybe a competitor, and you both go further, and you learn faster, and, and you shorten the learning curve by, by teaming up with someone. Well, I think it's, you know, it's a combination, isn't it? I guess that's sort of called co optetition isn't it? So you're <laughs> sort of in, in this sort of scenario. But the reality is that um, what's really, really important is to, to understand the, the the entire ecosystem, what, what the needs are and how, how you can help facilitate that. I think that a lot of the time you know, there's a tendency in corporations to want to control everything. Mm. But the, the, the reality is and, and the complexity of the world that we live in today means that you know, it is extremely low probability that any one particular business can really control or, or be successful in and of themselves, by themselves. Right. I mean, that just doesn't really happen anymore. And so you have to be able to look at um, 
new partnerships. They, those can't be a transactional kind of thing. You, I, if I'm going to have a successful partnership with um, any, anybody, it's mm -hmm. sort of understanding their objectives, understanding how I can help un meet the needs of that particular group, being honest about where my contributions should be, look at the gaps, and, and, and have a much more of a, an effective dialogue. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, I guess the explosion of partnerships, or partnershiping if you like, and, and, and ecosystems and bringing it all together is very, very important because you know, if you get that right, sustainability um, becomes that, very that, that sort of business sustainability. Because right. I think that in a lot of social issues, you, know, you can't just, it can't be a charitable exercise. You have to be able to create sufficient returns but appropriate returns, right, for everybody who's working in that system. So it's still a business. And it's still a business mm. because that sustainability will then ensure that it, it stays and continues. Mm -hmm. And because you know, ultimately there's a limit to charity, right? And so I think we need to make sure that we are you know, partnering in the right way to, to create catalysts of change um, in, in some respects and, right. and how you organise that but also making sure that you're partnering very, very carefully with this you know, amorphous group of, of, of folks. And that mm -hmm. takes a very different kind of working. But yes. I actually think that the, the, the long-term benefits of doing that effectively, you know, if, if I'm all of a sudden going to be able to um, create a benefit for a migrant worker that they're able to send money back home to their family and they get 50, do 50 more dollars because I've been able to cut that in half. That's material for that family. And, and that's really what, where the motivation comes from. Uh, that's, a good, that's a good motivator, actually. Very good. Uh, Musafar, give me your view on this. I mean, Maybank, you're the big boys on the block uh, in Malaysia. Um, would you collaborate with, with smaller banks or smaller companies? Yes, we do. We, and we want to. Uh, not just with banks, I think with uh, NGOs, other institutions. I think the two factors that, and I agree with Matthew, it's not easy, it's easier said than done. Yeah. And I think the two factors that always I find it challenging is, one is reciprocal. And when we collaborate, we've got to find what is, the, what is in it for us and what is in it for the other party. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, what is the red line that we know that this collaboration is not working? Uh, and, and that is usually the, the tough part. How do, you, how, do you, how do you identify that line? That, that's where, uh, where, where I, I agree with Matthew on what's the objectivity of, of, the, uh, uh, of the collaboration. One example, I give you a simple one. Uh, early in the year, we have collaborated with a few NGOs to provide homes for a big flood in, in Kelantan. And it was tough because we want to make sure which NGOs is more efficient to build the homes. Mm -hmm. We're ready with the funds. And, uh, you, uh, and, um, and, that, and the rate line is basically we say, look, if you can account uh, the materials, the workmanship, the, the, the labor and so forth, uh, we will provide the funds. And, uh, you know, this is not just merely a charity. We want to mm -hmm. make sure that the charity is effective and we want to make sure that homes are set up within a month or two. Wonderful. Uh, and, and that's the type of collaboration that we wanted to do. Oh, and I'm in the way in from your perspective. Sure. Um, I was involved in uh, my previous jobs in establishing an asset management uh, entity. And that asset management entity um, got some good ideas from the United Nations, where almost a group of huge number of companies have gathered together and collaborated to call themselves ethical investment companies. And those ethical investment companies have the value of around uh, above $30 trillion. So you have a huge amount of entities that fit into that uh, criteria and that you could choose from and you could uh, transact with them and feel the comfort that they have at least some of the variables or ethical standards that you'd like to deal with. Another uh, entity or thought that I went through in collaboration and uh, sustainability is actually uh, social media. Uh, all of them, if you start utilizing it and you start seeing the wave of people and the interest, uh, the nature of human beings uh, usually tilts towards that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would call it um, the yin-yang, we're made out of two basic products. One is the soul and the other one is the mud. And once we go and see some ideas that talk about uh, sustainability or have that comfort, even in social media, you'll find a huge flood come into it and it does help. 
and I have good experience personally into this. Mm. Okay, and uh, Mele. Yeah, just following on what has been said, I think the firms that are willing to cooperate and um, they have no shortage of platforms on a local level, on a, inter on a uh, global level. I think at the top is then we can start with the agencies like UN, IBRD, and their agencies, OECD, I mean, great in corporate governance, for example, and, and uh, following on, on, on the financial investor side. Uh, uh, U.S. Department of Labor has just announced new guidelines uh, urging the investors, the financial investors, not to take into account only the narrow view on shareholders, but the broader view on stakeholder mm -hmm. responsibility. So responsible investing has been set uh, as a guideline by the U.S. Department of Labor. This is a very important development because they set the global standards for institutional investors in their making, in making their uh, the investment decisions. Uh, and there are a lot of industrial, uh, I think, business platforms in the financial world, uh, which is basically uh, missioned for uh, responsible investing. They only invest in green companies. They invest in... Uh, responsible companies, et cetera, et cetera. So there are all sorts of platforms. I have a lot of names that I can share with you, but we don't have time for those. But it's a long list. It is a very long list. Uh, I think that's, that's uh, uh, what should make us uh, kind of happier, that uh, there's a lot of agencies, uh, or most of them on a voluntary basis, working on this issue, and the businesses are collaborating with such platforms. Mm, all right, thanks to all of you for that. We're going to throw it out to uh, you folks out there in the audience right now. If anyone has a question, put up your hand, and we'll get a microphone over to you. We have one from a gentleman down here in the front and one from a gentleman back here. If you could please state your name and uh, your company, that would be much appreciated thank before you. your question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Steve McCoy. Uh, my company is Counterpoint Consulting. I'm a sustainability consultant. Great. Great. Uh, I'd like to ask a supplementary question to a question that you asked earlier, Lisa. And the question was, um, do we have to sacrifice profitability to be sustainable? Mm. And um, none of your panel actually asked for clarification about what you mean by profitability. Everybody said, you know, great answers. But one of the things that I've found uh, that happens in the real world is that although uh, a lot of CEOs will talk about long-term sustainability and say the right things, often what happens on the ground is determined by what I call uh, the tyranny of quarterly financial <laughs> reporting. Sure. So, you know, the clarification is, do you mean my quarterly financial profitability or my annual profitability or my profitability in five years. Mm. And so my supplementary question is that as we move from an unsustainable world to a sustainable world or sustainable corporations, do we need to say goodbye to quarterly financial reporting scheduling? Mm. Because it doesn't reflect the kind of 21st century companies that, that we want to um, move forward with. And it puts a lot of pressure on those uh, CEOs to deliver the results. What do you guys think? Uh, okay, Mele. Uh, I'll, I'll take that because there was one of the points that I was going to raise I mean, huh? in the cl as closing remarks. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, I think uh, the short-termism that has been basically uh, go governing the, bi the business world, and still is, uh, unfortunately, is, has all to do with this. Uh, is a big challenge for the long-term sustainability issue because most Western public firms operate on quarterly reporting. Well, they give guidelines to the investors on a quarterly basis, and then they report on those performances on a quarterly basis. So there is a severe pressure, there has been always a severe pressure on part of the management to manage the quarterly reporting process. Mm -hmm. And aside from reporting, it, uh, it also has to do with the corporate corporate performance and reward systems, and which are geared towards short-term profitability and so forth. So if, if you're talking about the, the, that sustainability, responsible corporation is good, if there's a consensus on that, I think we should start talking about the how to eliminate those quarterly guidelines and the reporting to system as well. Some US companies have already started doing that. Um, uh, if, if, I may, if I may add into this one, um, in the very beginning of my remarks, I have said, and we don't understand that. Yes, and I'm translating it. 
Um, it's like uh, definitely you do work for uh, your life as if you live forever and uh, work for your life after as if you die tomorrow. So this is the important thing and uh, this is our teachings and this is uh, an Islamic conference and uh, this is what we understand how to live with it. Uh, along with that uh, line, probably I, I, I would think with your thoughts, how can we actually have the reporting done in a way that it does include the thought of are we looking at the long term or is it just short term uh, point of views and uh, short term profitability and uh, bonuses and all of that? <laughs> well, uh, okay, Musafar, I want you to weigh in on this as well, please. Yes. Um, um, thank you for the question, and I, I, I wish there's no more quarterly <laughs> uh, 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 numbers, but we can't get away with it. I mean, mm. it, it is a check and balance. I, I, we do need have to, to, uh, to answer to the, uh, the shareholders, to the analysts, and to the market. Uh, on quarterly earnings. But I think, if I would put on a, a different angle, I think the management and the board have to be very clear and responsible what is short term and what is long term. Uh, and in all honesty, sometimes and, and uh, uh, we, we miss the point on that bit. Uh, we have to uh, sell hard uh, to the market, to the, to the investment community, to even to, in my case, to my board, what is the long term uh, uh, investments and, and what is the, the short term gains. Because when we look at a long-term investments and uh, long-term commitment, there is always a, a check and balance of that quarterly bit. And, and we have to be very clear on that part. Uh, and and uh, we cannot take for granted on, 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 on and pushing hard and selling hard to the, uh, to the various community on, on this bit. Um, and I think that's the part that we sometimes fail to distinguish these two. Uh, and that's where uh, analysts could, uh, could punish you as an Indian corporation. Matt. Yeah, I, I think you could probably move to a little bit of both. I think that most companies have a portfolio of activities. Some are shorter term, some are medium term, some are longer term. Mm -hmm. And and some of the, 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 the some sustainability related initiatives are by definition long term because people recognise that the, the health of their business or the future of their business really is predicated on fundamentally changing aspects of their business. And in, in, in a lot of respects, they may try a number of things in order to do that. It's like um, if you're in uh, private equity or venture capital, you don't just back one company, right? You try a portfolio approach. And I think that a, a, lot, of, a lot of the time, if, we, if I say talk about our company in terms of financial inclusion, we're doing more than, I think, 170 different programs across mm -hmm. at least 50 um, countries. The, 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 the dimensions of each of those are quite different, but the fundamental objectives are still the same. And I think that what we find is that um, we, we're recognizing that if we are going to be successful in the mm -hmm. future, that we will need to adopt those principles. And so I think that um, with Mustafa in the sense that um, you know, it's no longer the, you know, those, those, the quarter isn't going to go away. Um, but at the same time, if you take a balanced point of view and, and, and look at of the, of the business at a much longer term perspective, and you'll then start doing these sustainability initiatives because if you're mm -hmm. purely short term, you wouldn't do any of it. So I do think there's perhaps a, an in-between uh, that needs to happen and yeah. you need to just have that sincerity of leadership behind it. To, to make it happen. I, I absolutely agree that the quarterly report, it's not going away. Investors no. take their money way too seriously, so you're not going to get away with that. So let me flip it around on you guys. Do you think companies need to make more of an effort to educate investors about the benefits of sustainability? You know, I don't know whether... It, I think it depends on the industry you're in and what you're, you're looking at. I think that in some cases, I think it'll be, it's fairly evident. If we say we use the oil and gas industry, you know, there's been a lot of issues about, you know, reckless behavior and, and or engineering and that's created an environmental catastrophe that has cost a company billions and billions of dollars. Um, and so, and, and people have had to adjust to, to that. Um, I think that it's, it's something that, that we need to understand and you need to make evident. But in, in many cases, I think that it's already out there, mm -hmm. recognize that you can do well as a company by doing good as a company. I think it's, it's, it's rel pretty well understood in my view. I'm, I'm so sorry, I'm gonna be very rude here. Lisa, I, we'll be, I'm gonna be out of time. I could forget to walk out here for a while. <laughs> That's fine. 
Thank you so I'm much. Dodging for the question. Us. Could we get a big <laughs> round of applause, please, for Musafar for taking part in our panel today? It's been wonderful. Thank you so much. He has to uh, scoot oh. off to a very important uh, high-level meeting, and we were informed about this beforehand. So, if you guys don't mind, I'd like to continue. Um, for just a couple of minutes, and, and we have one more question from the audience I'd like to get from this gentleman over here. And we then we're planning to question. blame him for any Malaysian questions, so <laughs> he ran away. <laughs> no, he, we, we knew in advance but, that he but, did have to take be, off. Before you do that, Lisa, just to say a few things on the same matters, that the, the short-termism, i.e. core to the reporting, mm -hmm. is not compatible with what we're talking about here, sustainability That's for right. in the long run. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm a realist, uh, uh, but I'm, I'm also an ideologist. In mm -hmm. the case, so I'm, I, I know where we're headed to, and we're going to get there, so we can expedite that process. Right. There's a disconnect, isn't yeah, there? Exactly. So. Yeah, between, between the sustainability and our current way of thinking. OK, sir, you had a question. Yes, hello. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Scott Liddell, uh, and I run a not-for-profit organization in Afghanistan called the Turquoise Mountain Foundation. Um, and I've actually just come down from another session uh, on an upper floor tucked away in a corner about social enterprise, um, but very much starting from the perspective of small not-for-profits and organizations working in the creative industries. But many of the themes are exactly the same that you've just been discussing to do with social inclusion, to do with blending uh, financial with social returns. Um, but sometimes I feel as someone coming from the NGO sector that we, we're talking about the same kinds of ideas, um, but in parallel conversations. Um, and there aren't actually that many opportunities to uh, become part of the same conversation. Obviously, luckily, we have forums like this where we can meet. But otherwise, um, often, there seem to be parallel tracks going on. So I was just wondering how you think, um, you know, what could be done to make sure that we are in a more sort of constant conversation on these things. Muzaffa mentioned just before leaving about uh, don't, you know, making donations to, to build houses and so on. So there are lots of moments of discrete interaction, but how we could make it a more uh, sustained and, and fruitful interaction. Well, I mean, I, I can very quickly comment on that in the sense that I think that if your company is sincerely interested in this, all of a sudden, you, you have to build processes and structures within your organization that make sure you uh, are, by definition, inclusive with um, these, this, this group of stakeholders. I think mm -hmm. that if you looked at where we are today compared to where we were perhaps 10 years ago in terms of our engagement with NGOs, you know, we are miles further down the track today. Um, we, we interact with... Um, international, mm -hmm. multinational organizations, large structured organizations um, like the World Bank. Um, then we're with a, a range in the financial inclusion space. There are literally hundreds of small um, agencies and consultancies that we need to partner with, um, community engagement agencies, um, you know, small, small um, groups of people, um, private corporations, private donors, etc. So we have learnt to, to engage, but I, I, would, I would say that if your company is sincere about making a difference in this space, um, you have to, by definition, go out and engage your ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And you know, it, it does sound, sound a bit, bit trite to a certain degree, but if you get that alignment through conversation, um, that, that you will do things that are much more powerful. I think a little bit of the challenge is that the NGO community is a little bit suspicious of the business community, mm -hmm. and the business community are equally um, a little bit unsure as to you know, what the, the agenda of a particular NGO will be. And so I think that the only way that you're going to deal with that, just like any other um, situation, is with communication and engagement. Right. And so you have to build those structures, and if your company is sincere, you will have them. All right, we are um, out of time, but I want to end this panel. We're, we're going to take a few additional minutes. I just want to end this panel with a round of quick-fire questions to sum up what these guys have been saying and what they're thinking they're going to have. Ten seconds each to answer these questions. And I'm going to start with you, Mele, down on the end. And your first question is, what is the most common mistake you've seen being made 
in the quest for profitability? Ten seconds or less. Well, just as we have just discussed, I'm short termism. <laughs> the quarterly guidances and the reporting system and the reward systems associated with it. Wonderful. People uh, lose their ethics uh, in those points to make uh, short-term profitability or their bonuses by default. Matt. Yeah, I mean, I think obviously the, the short-termism is there um, as a concern. I also think that a commitment to sustainable business means this fundamental change in corporate culture and business processes. Mm -hmm. You've got to walk the talk. So you have to sort of adjust that in a portfolio of, of actions. So thinking short-term and sustainability, mutually exclusive, not going to work. Okay, Mele, what keeps you awake at night? Well, as I told you before, we are very big in fast food business, quick service restaurant business in Turkey and China. So food safety is very critical to me. <laughs> and also the Turkish devaluation wakes me up at night. <laughs> Ayman. Sure. Um, the thought of what keeps me awake at night, sometimes people think only about the negative side. For me, it actually is the positive side of thinking about my DNA and how I'd like to connect the world and uh, how I could get... Uh, us and our standards be seen uh, by the rest of the world and get them to feel comfortable with it and understand it and benefit out of it and maybe slow down any negative effects that have mm -hmm. been caused due to being distanced from those standards. All right. Matt. Yeah, I, I think in, in our space, for our business, obviously, financial technology or fintech is very hot right now. Mm -hmm. So there's probably somebody or a dozen or 20 or 100 people trying to put us out of business in a garage or a small hut somewhere. So I think that <laughs> for us, it's you know, how do we embrace and, 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 and look at every kind of potential disruptive technology um, with, you know, with, with a comprehensive um, technology management process? That's the one big thing. And the other one we touched on, which was regulation. How do we ensure we have you know, minimized the unintended consequences of regulation? Okay, two very valid concerns there. All right, and final question is for each of you, and we'll start with you, Mele. What is your final piece of advice that you would like to leave this audience with today? Beware of disruption, I think, uh, which is happening ac across all business sectors, thanks to uh, technology, uh, digitalization, and mobility. Um, disruptive trends are basically is a big threat to everybody's business. Mm -hmm. So you are responsible to yourselves to embrace disruption uh, before it kills you. <laughs> before it gets you. Ayman. Um, I would say that uh, thinking positively and being happy and uh, thinking about the world in uh, a nice uh, green environment uh, is actually the way that people would like to dream about and you can make it a reality. That's really nice. Matt. Um, Three things. Um, corporate authenticity is key, so the tone from the top, commitment from the top, working through the organization. We've talked about it, partnerships are critical. And the third one's going to be embrace innovation and, and really try to disrupt your own business model, because if you do that, you're going to be able to serve, you know, identify these new underserved, um, unmet needs of mm -hmm. important communities that are out there and you'll be able to make a difference. Thank you so much for joining us today. Let's give them a big round of applause, please.